there, it's Lucy Gable again, exercise physiologist, nutritionist, and coach. And welcome to the Lucy Fit Healthy Lifestyle Channel. Today I'm interviewing Darren Steves, also an exercise physiologist, adjunct professor in kinesiology at Dalhouse University in Nova Scotia, Canada, creator of the Grit Resilience Program, and co-author of the book, Are You Ready? Stop Wishing It Was Friday, a book about balancing life and work and family and your own health. Welcome, Darren. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. So, Darren, you're going to explain to us today why it's normal to fail in health goals. And I'm very interested in that. And you're also going to talk about how that builds resilience. I know a lot of people who start a health program or start trying to get healthier and they fail one time and that's it. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm really interested in what we're going to talk about today. So we're trying to change that mindset to not seeing failure as, oh my gosh, here I go again, which the psychologist will call uh, learned helplessness. Um, we want to actually see, and, and what we see in resilient people is they see it as more of a problem solving tool that I've had this failure and hey, what am I going to learn from it? As opposed to I've had this failure, here I go again, I'm, I'm back into this uh, failure mode and then grief ends up for long term. So we want to see failure as part of a process to moving towards your vision or your goal in life. Tell us a little bit about your experience in the health and fitness industry and how you've been able to observe so many people in their right. quest for achieving fitness goals. Similar to uh, a lot of people in our field and you can probably attest to it, I've worked in high performance sport, I worked as, for lack of a better term, personal trainer. Um, I've, for a lack of a better term, a life coach to help people with uh, with their resiliency. Um, I've, as you as you noted, I, I do some research through uh, the School of Health and Human Performance at Dalhousie. Um, so I've I've juggled. I've taught fitness instructors. I've taught fitness classes. So I've had a, this broad base of experience in in the field. And what I've come to realize in the last three or four years, I've kind of narrowly focused on some areas that I think are important. One is resilience. And then one is to try to, to, to continue to help people, which is my number one value, um, to change a behavior. Um, so even though we're both uh, physiologists, exercise physiologists, I'm, I'm sure you probably can agree with me that we spend a lot of time in that psychology world. And then you work with Olympic athletes as well. Yeah, so that happened while I was at the university. I ended up working with 30 different sports over that time. So from hurling to equestrian, um, wow. you name it, badminton, judo, uh, taekwondo, sail laser sailing. Um, so yeah, I experienced them all. But in our neck of the woods, it, it's paddling. We're the province of lakes. So at that time, 75% of the national paddling team was from Nova Scotia. So it just started to happen that I was working with 30, 20, 10, and then just canoe kayak. So you've trained with these Olympic athletes. Do you say that they also fail? Yes. So we had a major failure in Rio and the athlete was amazing. So after some grief, we did a full two day debrief with all of the sports scientists, the high performance director and the head coach. And it was painful, but we learned from it and we're going to be better because of it. That athlete's going to be better because of it. And I love how you said that athlete was awesome and yet they failed. I mean, you can still be awesome and fail. That's what we're getting into with this conversation. Yeah, you can leave a legacy, which is what he did. So you can, he left a legacy because he was also a two-time world champion and a medalist from before. So he helped change the system through his success. Now he's actually doubled down and changed the system because of his failure. A majority of life is failing. It's not succeeding. What? <laughs> yeah, exactly. We still succeed. I'm not saying we don't succeed, yeah. but a lot of stuff we do, we fail at, and that's cool. We fall off our bike when we're a kid to learn how to ride, and you still fall off occasionally. Doesn't mean you can't ride a bike. So you just have to be cool with it. And it, 
what that does is just drop the feelings of anxiety, drops the feelings of depression. You might have 18 failures before you hit the success. I mean, there's a million paddlers in the world and I work with canoe kayak. Only one of them gets to stand on the top of the podium. Does that mean the person standing beside them is a failure? And I'm using sport analogies because that person was better that day. Um, so again, usually you have a whole bunch of failures that lead to a success. And at any point, if you kind of give up because of that failure, you don't give your chance, give yourself the chance to be successful. And failure builds resilience is what you've said. So what is resilience? Stress isn't an object that's sitting on the table here. It's how you perceive it. So there could be an incident happen and you would perceive it differently than I. And our suggestion is that's kind of where you fit on the resiliency curve. So looking at um, your personal competence, so your social intelligence, um, your emotional intelligence, uh, self-esteem, um, and self-reliance. Are you, are you a resourceful person? Do you have personal structure? And then the physical uh, health attributes. Are you sleeping? Um, do you have a plan of how you're going to sleep more? Um, physical activity and nutrition. All these feeder into resiliency. Can you talk a little bit more about why resilience is being sought after now in corporations, for example? Why is it so important? So organizations are keen on looking at it because the initial research shows it increases productivity, emotional intelligence, which a lot of people keep hearing about. If we can help people be more resilient, they're less likely to say go to anger um, as, as their coping mechanism when in a stressful situation, rather that problem solving approach. So it helps drive the organization forward because um, the two big key factors with resilient people are their optim their optimists and their problem solvers. I think most organizations would like to have optimistic people and people who actually can solve the problems rather than just constantly talk about the problems. How does resilience come from failure? Sure. So if you look at some of either the sport research or some of the um, kids research, the children research, we know that it is a learned skill. There are some people that it is uh, nature. They, they have inbuilt resilience and they're trying to figure out what are the physiological and psychological mechanisms of that. But, but a majority of people can learn. So um, out of failure, so we, there was a great study published with uh, high performance athletes and what they found is a majority of them had a major adversity in their life. Um, so those that actually medaled at Olympic games have had some sort of major adversity because Similar to what we just said, out of adversity, what we do is we learn from it and we grow from it. So, you know, whether we use the term resiliency or growth or what have you, that, that is some of the key things that happen in life. And no one wins all the time. It's, uh, it's normal to fail. And I don't see fail as a, as a bad word. A lot of people, because my wife's a school teacher, I was supposed to be a school teacher. There's certainly been of avoidance to use the word fail, but whatever term you want to use, didn't succeed, didn't hit my goal, that's okay. It's, it's okay. The key thing is to learn from it and move forward. So are you saying actually that failure is necessary almost? Because if you don't fail, you don't learn? I would, I would concur because I, I, don't, I don't know about you, but I've been in so many conversations with parents and coaches and you know, everyone's saying, why are, why is the next generation not resilient? I don't know if that's the case or not. Uh, we're doing a, a research study on that, but the potential is, and of course the conversation comes around that we don't allow people to fail and we don't allow them to fail in elementary school and junior high and in sport, everyone gets a medal. So all these terms and conversations are happening. And yeah, I think there's a potential that, you know, if you don't fail, you don't learn. And we learned that through, as I brought up at the first, through that Olympic experience. You did mention something about Vibe when we spoke at first, mm -hmm. E I B E. So we own a, a wellness consulting company, total health consulting company for organizations. We go in and do strategic planning. Um, and we have a platform coming out next month called Insight Wellness. So it's a, it's a web application to help people evolve. And we looked at all the different theories and all the different concepts and said, okay, how do people get motivated to change a behavior? So we wrote our own motivational model. And of course, everyone loves acronyms. 
So we went with um, Vibe. And that's looking at a vision for yourself. The I is your internal values. B is the barriers to being successful. And then E is what we call the end result, and that's goal setting. And we think that's the best way for someone to sustain and change a behavior. Can you explain a little more about that? What are you going to use that for? Sure. Is that everyone strives or moves directly to the end result, which is a goal setting. You know, and I, I think that's been proliferated over the last 20 years. You need to set a goal. It needs to be smart, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. That's terrific. But what we found is if you go right to the end result without doing the setup work, you're less likely to sustain the behavior because what happens is you hit the end result, you hit the goal and it's now what? And whether you look at some of the weight loss programs that have been very popular, I won't use their names. That's kind of what was happening with a lot of people. And then they would just go, okay, we felt if you put some meaning behind it, if you know, why are you losing the weight? Why do you want to sleep better? Why do you want to be physically active? Why do you want to change the relationship with your wife, spouse, your partner? Um, that actually starts to get at this value-based living. If you have a vision for yourself, and if you looked at the barriers of why you weren't successful before, so if it was weather, you know, we live on a rock jutting out in the middle of the Atlantic here in Nova Scotia. So if you plan for last year, I wasn't successful because the weather came and I didn't have alternatives. We feel if you do all of that, a bit of work prior to setting your goals, you're more likely to be successful because it's more meaningful. Getting your values down is maybe the most important thing in terms of reaching your goal. Yeah, I would suggest it is because it's going to what keeps bringing you back. We're all going to have periods of a couple months where we're not I wouldn't say not living our values. We're just kind of what we call sitting in yellow. So you're kind of thinking about it, but you're not doing it. But what's going to draw you back is, is your values. And did I hear you say there should be a little bit of planning involved? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. That. I mean, yeah. Really, I mean, like, I just want to get fit. I just look at a magazine. I do this workout and it's done, right? Yeah. You know, if it was easy as reading a magazine or doing, you know, a five minute uh, workout on the floor, then we'd all be super fit, super healthy with smiles on our face. So I think we have to look at it in a different way. I'm not bashing those types of people and those types of things. That's cool. But I think to have more of a global success in our society, we have to, to look at it differently. Because again, I know in Canada, and actually I know the US stats as well, uh, obesity rates are skyrocketing, cancer rates are skyrocketing, um, and diabetes rates. So the World Health Organization said it's epidemic right now. So all those three big ones are happening and they're all lifestyle diseases and it's unfortunate. So we, we have some work to do. We're just, we don't believe we have a silver bullet. We just have a different take. I have seen in many people's lives that um, there's a calendar, there's a schedule for work. There may be social things in there as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the fitness is just, or the exercise, or even the grocery shopping is just something in the back of the head that will happen, but it's not on the schedule. It's yeah. not really in the plan. That's what I think about when we talk about planning. Is that what you're talking about, or is there more? No, for sure. So, um, one of the, you know, I, the psychologist doesn't like when I put percentages to resiliency. But if you look at the literature, probably 15% of resiliency is called personal structure. So resilient people have a structure to their life. And I just read the one thing with Keller, and he calls it time blocking. So you're more likely to be successful if you plan. And because we both know what will happen if you show, home, uh, show up at home at 5 o'clock and you didn't pre-plan your meal. Most people will turn to probably not a healthy alternative. So one of the things that I did when I was working with a lot of clients is they had to time block a time on the weekend to sit with their family, spouse, partner, and actually say, okay, what are we going to eat for the week? And then they would go to the grocery store with their list and have it. And so it would be planned out. And you can look at all the nutritional literature and that's where people are, are more successful. So absolutely 
um, having personal structure like that with whatever personal health aspects you want to change is very important. Uh, we both know that setting a time to be physically active and putting it in your schedule and also letting everyone in your life know those are the times is extremely important. You know, research says that if you exercise in the morning, you're more likely to be successful because no one else is up, the phone isn't ringing and there's, you're not starting work. But really it comes down to what is the best time for you that you're motivated, but then let everyone know around you so they're not going to ask you and deter you from it with knowing that that's your time. So is now a good time to talk a little bit about your book, which was about balancing life with work and family and wellness. Yeah. After 20 years and working with a whole bunch of people in different groups and, and hearing a, a, a lot of the same story coming through the office and coming over Skype and coming when people I'd speak to groups, they'd come up and tell me the story. And I was like, wow, this story is common. And then of course, as with most authors, there's a little bit of me in that story. So when we did this book, I, I didn't want to just write a tip book. I wanted to tell a story about Alex. And then at the end of the book, we put in the tips for each chapter. So is grit resilience training something like this? Yeah, it's, it's health, total health and resiliency. And what Alex experienced in the book and his family, I believe is is an example of a story of building resiliency. Because um, humans, when they're under stressful events, their natural tendency is to go to feel good. So alcohol, uh, drugs, at university, unprotected sex, they'll automatically go to that. So if we can build the tools that make them feel good, like going for a run, getting a good night's sleep, eating something healthy, so when we go to that low resiliency, we can turn to those coping skills, then that's a really good thing. And I think you see that in the book at the start, some negative coping skills, some negative thought processes. And as he builds that with his mentor, even during stressful events, you might have a fallback, that's normal. And the way to bounce forward is to build those skill sets that you learn, oh, I can get the same juices from doing these positive things as I did before doing these negative things. Most of my past clients had had the very same experience where it's always work and mm -hmm. they just get on a great, you know, start to exercising more or eating better or both. And then all of a sudden something happens at work and they feel just hand tied. They can't yeah. do anything about it in their own minds, you know, and that's what this guy went through. Yeah, I mean, there's two things that change a behavior. One is this, and the other is the environment that you're in. And both are extremely important. So I've lectured to numerous organizations, or not lectured, but, you know, had honest, frank conversations, what I call them, not lecturing. And I'll say, have you gone to your boss and talked about my personal health is I value it and it's important to me? And... I need to fit it in the run of a day to make my life more complete. And I'll get eye rolling in the, in the, uh, in the room all the time. They'll, so, oh, yeah, right. And what I do is I point the finger at them and say, okay, if you've actually had that conversation, why are you still working here? <laughs> but when the HR person has me in to do the talk, I give them that warning that I'm like, I'm going to be blunt. And I'm going to be challenging. I don't think you have to quit tomorrow, but you can use the value of that organization that they're providing me a salary to look after my family, look after my life. But I might want to start moving towards a place that creates the environment and my values match up. If they're not, if you're not in the environment that you want to be in, and I think you can think of a section of the book where that transpired, where one person was like, I'm glad I'm out of here. And what Alex did is figured out, how am I going to change my environment? I need to be part of the change. The other big thing that's happening in organizations now and, and in universities and even high schools is mentorship. And I think it's really important uh, that everyone has a mentor at different parts of their life. It might be different people, uh, but finding a mentor is, is a really positive thing. And, uh, you know, I wanted to make sure that was highlighted in the book. The other thing I wanted to make sure was highlighted which Sue and I spent the last three months making sure is that I didn't want to bash careers. 
Uh, it's okay to be passionate about your career. We seem to now have morphed to, um, you know, make it to five o'clock and then I can start living my life. And that's why we went with stop wishing it's Friday. I could have said stop wishing it's five o'clock because again, it's not work-life balance, it's life. So is there something you'd like to leave with the audience before we close today? Any summary view that you'd like people to take away? Yes, your health is your wealth. Ah. Yeah, uh, we try to manipulate and I let people pick their values and pick their vision for themselves. But uh, again, I'm, I'm usually pretty blunt and, and give the method to the madness. We, you and I try to push people to get personal health up the chain. So we know that if your personal health kind of isn't in your top three or four values, the likelihood of you being successful goes down. So take a hard look at it when you do, if you do your values and say, what does my personal health do? Because what I think most people will find out is that it, it drives everything else in your life. You can help other people. Um, you're happier. All these things transpire with personal health. And again, we could debate on what personal health is, but let's go with the big three, physical activity, sleep, and nutrition. Take a look at those in your life and see how you're making out with them and what can I start to move towards to improve those, which will improve all kinds of other. In Canada, I've been an advocate and I've written letters to government and let, written letters to doctors. I wish doctors at the end of every appointment would say, how are you sleeping? Are you physically active? And what are you eating? Yeah. We would be a much healthier society if that transpired. <clears throat> but we spent a lot of time talking about the psychology to get to that because it's not easy just to say, you should be physically active, you should eat better, and you should sleep more. There's a lot of stuff that happens before you actually start to do it. Darren Steves, thanks so much for joining us here on the Healthy Lifestyle channel. Thanks. Thank Good luck with all of this. And it was great to talk to you. I'm really glad we found each other over the internet. All right, everybody. Thanks for watching on the Healthy Lifestyle channel as well. If you like this video, click like and share it with your friends. Help them to get healthier too. And if you want more from me, subscribe. And if you want even more healthy lifestyle tips, subscribe to my blog at lucyfit.com.